Aloha. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak, and today we have our guest who's joined us more than anyone else in the history of the universe. Mike Aquilina is with us, and we're going to have the most interesting conversation, uh, among other things that we're going to talk about, is his new book, How the Fathers Read the Bible. That's referring to the early church fathers. I think that should be fascinating. And we're going to talk about how we wear, how we're wearing matching shirts today. By the way, remember, <laughs> you can join us and you can watch us on YouTube. Uh, we we uh, we uh, post it to YouTube uh, just after it's aired on EWTN. But if you want to get an early release of it, go to our website, deepadventure.com, hit the subscribe button, and uh, we'll e email it to you in the morning, the video version of the EWTN show. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of manly spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. Zoop up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha. Welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Today we have as our guest Mike Aquilina. He's going to join us in just a moment. I, I'm, I'm trying to, if you're watching us on YouTube, uh, you're going to see that he and I have almost like matching backgrounds because I'm trying to make mine look like his. Uh, uh, Mike Aquilina, uh, expert on the early church fathers and a good friend, welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Hey, thanks for having me, Bear. Okay, well, check it out. You guys have got to check this out on YouTube. <laughs> so get, guess what? We've got, you know, someone told me the other day, Mike, uh, I interviewed someone. They go, oh, I really like your background. They thought it was a fake background. <laughs> <laughs> but I you, get that all the time too. People ask, "Is that real?" I said, yeah, "It's real." <laughs> and I see that you have the commentaries on the early church fathers, what you talked me into getting. I have those yeah. too. But what I don't see, and I'm sure you have, is all these uh, these white. They look like the Encyclopedic Britannica. Are they up above they're behind you? the camera? Yeah, oh, they're, they're behind they're right the camera, in front of me, oh. so I can reach up and get them. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was the early church fathers who. Um, who uh, brought me back to the church, and most people who know my ministry know about that. But I got something pretty cool I want to talk about before with Mike. Um, and if you're on, if you're on YouTube, you can see this. I'm going to bring put it up to the window. Uh, it's a coin. I actually have two of these. This one though, uh, I, I I loved it so much I got one to give to one of my sisters as a as a present. I inherited this from my from my uh, mother and father. My dad was a deacon, Greg Wozniak, and really it was a ministry of my mom and my dad. And he used to have Mike a uh, retreat for businessmen. He was a business uh, consultant and very. Uh, he traveled the world speaking. Just was on the road mm -hmm. all the time speaking. And but he would have uh, the, uh, the presidents of corporations come to his his retreat. He built it a home in the north woods of Minnesota, by way up by. Bemidji almost, north of Brainerd, on a lake called Man Lake. And the name of the property was called Eagle's Rest. And the only way you could get there in those days was you had to have a map, right? You didn't have Google. And even Google wouldn't have gotten you to his house. So you, when you got to the little dirt, when you turned off the pavement to the dirt road, there was still several miles to get to his house on a very <laughs> winding road through the woods and around lakes and over bridges. So every time that you needed to make a decision on which way to go, there was an eagle, a golden eagle, uh, nailed to a tree that would tell you to go to fly in the direction of that eagle and eventually you would come to the property and the property was called Eagle's Rest and it's based upon that beautiful scripture uh, let's see you'll mount up with wings as eagles you'll run and not grow weary you'll walk and not grow faint and also the scripture that says he'll renew your youth as as an eagle and so it was very special to my mom and dad there was bald eagles in, on their property and, and out on the lake you would see the, them fish at fish you know they're great fishermen and so he would get he created this, this their house in a way that executives would come president presidents only of companies would come and he would give them uh, and they would have retreats Christian retreats there it was called the president's retreats and uh, one one uh, uh, something happened uh, we don't know we don't really don't know how this happened uh, but my mother, she's a super good cleaner. You know, she's the one who takes off the, the couch cushions and she's, she's cleaning like crazy. And one day when she was doing this, she found this coin. Hmm. And they contacted everyone that had ever been to a president's retreat. 
and they also used to host uh, Catholic charismatic prayer meetings in their home, and uh, no no one could tell them if they had lost this coin. And it, it's very diff. If, if they didn't know what it was, yeah, but they knew it was important, and so they sent it off to uh, the University of Minnesota, and the University of Minnesota uh, did their research. In fact, now on Google you can find out very quickly what it is. Mm -hmm. But it's a coin that was minted uh, during the car. Now I'm going to forget how to say it. The Jarkoba? Barkopa, it said on it. But the Barkopa revolt. Yes. Yeah, the Bar the Barkopa revolt. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and and you know when you and uh, between 66 and 70 A.D., which of course is the time of the early church fathers. And you know if you read all those books in the back of you, and probably some in the back of me, if you read a book on history. Very often, there's images of coins, and, and because it's one of the main ways we know that 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 what happened, what period of time we're in, like when in in a, in a, in a geological dig or things like that, is what era the coins are, and yeah. so I and so we don't know how how this coin coin came to be, but th this is one of the the two things that I have from my parents uh, when they passed away. My deacon Greg passed away about a year and a half ago. My sister Dawn made sure that I was the one that got this coin. Oh, that's sweet. That's yeah, really and so sweet. that's why I bought another one for her from Palestine, but it's not nearly the quality of this coin. Can you mm. tell us, can you jump into us, just tell us what the Barcoba uh, revolt was and, and where that places us in church history, and then we will talk about, we'll use that to talk about how the early church fathers uh, under, you know, read scripture. Well, a lot of people know that from 66 to 70, there was an uprising in the Holy Land, and uh, the Jews tried to, to retake the land uh, from the Romans, okay? They wanted to, uh, they wanted self-rule, they wanted to live according to the law, they did not want the interference of Gentiles, and, uh, and, and frankly, they were tired of a lot of the insults that came with Gentile rule. Uh, the, um, the Roman soldiers often profaned the city. They would often bring images of pigs into the city and that sort of thing, just to kind of tweak the people, just to give them a hard time. Uh, enough was enough. And, and, and I think um, around 66 AD, the, the, the rebellion started. It continued through 70 AD and 70, and, and, and the Romans laid siege to the city. And when they laid siege, they meant business. But also when, when the Jews rebelled, uh, they meant business too. And mm. so they fought fiercely, and they kept the Romans at bay, and uh, casualties were high. The Romans were trying to starve them out, and uh, the people inside uh, were so desperate, inside the city were so desperate that they, re they resorted to cannibalism. Uh, the, the, uh, the historian Flavius Josephus has left us a, a detailed description of this. It's a sad story, really. Um, but the Romans did prevail. They did enter the city. They did... Um, bring down the temple, you know, and just as our Lord had predicted, not a stone was left on another. If you go there today, you don't see any remains of the temple. You see the wailing wall, which is just the retaining wall on the hill leading up to the temple, just the retaining wall. Nothing of the temple is left standing. It was burned to the ground, and the Romans really did re-landscape the entire area. Um, in, uh, you know, 50 years later, the Jews tried another uprising, uprising, and that was the Bar Kokhba re revolt. Okay, uh, and and that too ended in defeat for them. They were not able to um, to reclaim the Holy Land for uh, for their people. Um, it ended up being an important moment in Jewish Christian relations because the Christians refused to get involved in the uprising. Um, they did not uh, sympathize with the nationalism of the uprising at all, because Christ had come to. Uh, to bring bring about a new covenant and the new covenant was not only with israel but with the gentiles as well so in a sense they felt it wasn't their fight in pro uh, they had received prophecies that told them to leave the city of jerusalem and they left the city of jerusalem and they went their way you know to the four winds and by that time uh, so so you're saying th this coin was which revolt yes. was it that was the second, uh, the second revolt in the 130s from yeah. the from Bar Kokhba, and he was he was the guy who was who was kind of posturing as a messiah figure, right? You know, right. He's the son of the star, so uh, that's what Bar Kokhba means, uh, and um, and so he was evoking some of the Old Testament imagery of um, of the of the messiah uh, and, and uh, appropriating him to himself. And the interesting thing about that is uh, around that time, 66 to 70 A.D. Um, um, 
that's when temple worship ended. Yes, yes, it and came so, to an end. Yeah, uh, so that that brought, it was interesting because prior to that, the, the church referred to the the leaders of the local churches as, as presbyters or bishops, but in time then, they, they weren't referred to as priests until after the temple uh, worship ended. I don't know when, when they began to be referred to as priests, but presbyters, in the in in the uh, scripture, when it refers to the, that with uses that word, that's generally referring to priesthood, right? Yes, yes. Uh, I, I mean the uh, the the tasks of a priest uh, were always associated with the office of presbyter. Uh, we find as early as um, the the apostolic fathers. So you have Clement, and you have Ignatius and you have um, Polycarp talking about the offices in the church. And Ignatius is the one who spells it out most clearly and in detail. And he does refer to the office of bishop and presbyter and deacon. Uh, and he talks about how these play out in the life of the church. And, uh, and the, others, the others don't don't do it as specifically as Ignatius does, but they do corroborate the things that Ignatius said. Well, we're gonna we're gonna get uh, back. We gotta get, we gotta go. We'll be right back. But this now we're gonna get into a whole new subject. This is gonna be really <laughs> we're gonna this is gonna be good. really cool, really cool. Yeah. We're talking with Mike Aquilino. He's he, Mike Aquilino is by far the guest I've had on my show show more than anyone. I just love having him. We'll be right back with the Bear Wozniak adventure. This is Daniel the Boone Markham with another episode of Country Up. Gitter. If you don't know it in your knower, you better get it in your gitter because if you haven't got it in your gitter, you'll never know it. Yep, you heard that right. Information ain't understanding any more than understanding is wisdom. Knowing is just a nod of your head, but knowing something in your knower means you got understanding. But before the knowing, you got to get information into your gitter. Your gitter is a place where the information is caught rather than see it as a flyby. Got it? Good. Having fun yet? I am. Folks today know boo information thanks to the internet, but it's mostly information without context. Regarding context, it can be likened to people saying they want socialism. I get wanting a lot of free stuff, but there ain't no free lunch partner. Somebody paid for it or will pay for it. The chickens will come home to roost. Folks who lived through the Cold War and beyond got context to socialism. They saw how it eventually ruined everything it touched. Their context got them wise concerning politicians promising more and more free stuff. Jesus said a good tree cannot bear bad fruit and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Took time for the bitter fruit of socialism to ripen and be eaten. It always got to be a nasty tasting. So the story of the Mori is this. Get context to what you're reading and hearing. We need more folks with wisdom rather than a bunch of semi-automatic word slingers. King Solomon wrote, Wisdom will be life for you. Wisdom, not words, ensures your tree will produce good fruit. Take a bite and enjoy. This is Daniel the Boone Markham at countryup.org on a journey a few miles this side of heaven. Now you can journey with other men in the adventure of a lifetime, growing in manly virtue and servant leadership through Bears Man Cave non-Facebook community and our three-year school of manliness. Video, audio, and written content, as well as self-assessments help you to chart your new course. Join us at deepadventure.com. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak Adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha. Welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We want to invite you to please, please go to our website, deepadventure.com. Patrick Gervais and I spent so much time uh, building and developing this new uh, website, and I don't think there's anything else like it 
in the history of mankind, because of course technology is always changing. But if you go to deepadventure.com, I'm going to speak uh, specifically to the men right now. Uh, you're invited to join the Man Cave and Bears School of Manliness. That's right. You heard it here first. Bears School of Manliness. But really, you know, you think about in the Old Testament, Obadiah and the School of Prophets. And you think about the Cave of Adullam and uh, that that was a place where men, kind of misfits, all joined up with King David when he was, uh, when he was on the run from King Solomon. And uh, they say it says this was a band, you know, men who owed money or were running from the law, running from their mother law, whatever. They're there in the cave, and they formed each other, and God formed them to become the mighty men of valor. And I also was reading in, uh, in, uh, recently about the the Inklings, you know, uh, C.S. Lewis and G.K. Chest. I'm not C.S. Lewis and and Tolkien and that group uh, over there in uh, Oxford, and Cambridge, uh, and their their group, the Inklings, was originally called the Cave of Adullam. So I thought that was pretty cool to know. But anyway, we're, we're inviting you to join. And if you do that, we have a, a twice a month, we have a Zoom video meetup. One is with the whole group of men, and one is with a, a special team that you're, that you're invited to be part of. And then you can go through the three-year curriculum. We all go through it together, uh, the School of Manliness. And it's videos, it's audios, it's written comment, co- uh, content. It's just really a cool mix of, of, of features that walk you through these, these uh, basically 36 rules of manliness. But the coolest thing that's happening is men are doing this with their sons. Men are uh, join the cave in the school of manliness, and then they have their, their sons join, but the sons are not allowed to join the cave. That's for adults only. But the men then are, uh, the, their, their sons are assigned a username and access to, and they can actually track their son's progress as they go through. Every time they finish a lesson, there's a, you click it and you can see the progress. And you can lead your sons once a week through the School of Manliness. And so a lot of men are doing that. I don't know any other curriculum like this. Uh, I'm sure it, it exists, but I don't know anything else like that. So go to uh, the deepadventure.com website, find out more about uh, the Man Cave and Bear School of Manliness. We have Mike Aquilina, by far. He's been on. He's been a guest on the show more than anybody. Uh, if you're watching us on video, you'll see that we're, we're wearing almost matching shirts today. It's kind of a big deal. But we've been talking about the early church fathers and um, this coin that my mother and father. We still don't know how it came to be. They found it in their 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 couch. It was a. It wasn't like a used couch or anything. Uh, the revolt in Jerusalem in 66 and 70 A.D., which is about that time when we refer to refer to the early church fathers. And, and my son Joshua, who's uh, producing the show, he has a question for you. He's heard that, in, and I think this is what you were referring to, when Jesus prophesied that there would be no stone left on top of another of the temple, uh, you, were, you were saying that that wailing wall there was not actually part of the temple, it's a retaining wall. I, I mean, the, the temple could only be on this one spot, and that spot was, was built upon that rock, and, okay. and supposedly the rock under the dome is, is the rock that was at the foundation of the temple. Okay, and what rock was that? Uh, well, you know, according to Jewish folklore, it's, it's the rock that held, held down chaos. It kept it underground. <laughs> well, okay? I need that rock. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. You know, it's it, uh, but under it's it's the rock that kind of kept a lid on things. It's uh, oh my the foundation God. stone. It was known as Interesting. because the temple was the center of the earth. I mean, we we don't understand that today because you know we have churches. Our churches on are on every street corner in a little town like mine. I'm looking looking out my window and I see all these steeples, right? You know, uh, and we can go to any one of those and worship, right? And mm-hmm. we'll have have our worship. Um, you know, for for Jews, for for faithful Jews, for the people of Israel, there was only one place on earth where you could offer sacrifice. Only one place on the entire earth, and that was the temple in Jerusalem. And all adult males were recru- re- were required by law to make pilgrimage to Jerusalem three times a year and offer sacrifice there so it, it's it's unique on the entire earth and it is kind of the lifeline to heaven it was even called the belly button of the world you know it's oh, the navel of the we, world. We, we call that uh, in hawaii the puka yeah yeah so yeah, i mean that's where yeah. we get we get life we get we get all the sustenance oh, we need from heaven yeah, the navel so, yeah so um so so you know when we're gestating when we're in our mother's womb so so that's that's how it functioned on earth and so when the temple when the temple was destroyed it was an utter catastrophe it was a disaster 
uh, the temple that the temple was the place where uh, where you turned to pray it's it's the place where you went to offer sacrifice and you could go to no other place I mean it's powerful I mean I, I mean remember being on a flight and a Hasidic Jew stood up and went to a certain area of the plane and faced a certain direction and said his prayers you know he was facing yes. the temple and and now yes. though in, in the mass we have that 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 the the verse quoted uh, you're shaking your head up and down you know what I'm gonna say well from east to west a perfect offering will be made so it was prophesied that it would be, and, what, and so so what happened uh, uh, to to the Jewish people at that time? Then how did they continue their worship? You know, you ask you ask a, a great question, and and um, the the great Jewish scholar Baruch Levine, uh, who just died a, a few weeks ago, um, Baruch Levine um, said that what happened in his view was that two new religions came out of the destruction of the temple all right two new religions and and his his thesis is this that that um that the uh the people we know today as as jews they took the worship of the synagogue and they went in one direction he said in the other direction went the christian church with the sacrifice of the mass he said the sacrifice of the mass is like the continuation of the sacrifice that went on in the temple. And you're right. I mean, Catholics have always applied the prophecy of Malachi to their celebration of the mass. That is that is one of the most quoted uh, Old Testament oracles uh, among the early Christians. And it's almost always cited in reference to the Holy Mass. So, so yes, we see worship as as continuing. Sacrificial worship continues uh, in the Holy Mass. It's no longer uh, it no longer takes place in the temple, and that's why our Lord predicted that. Um, but uh, but but Jews Jews do not have sacrificial worship now, and uh, and they they continue uh, their uh, the the prayer in the synagogue, and that's where they observe the holy days and so on. So. Um this dude in the Old Testament, uh, just unusual, just out of nowhere, the the king the the king of of Salem, right? Where wasn't that Melchizedek? Melchizedek, right? The, a pre, and, and so in the Mass we say that we it's a royal priesthood according to the order of Melchizedek, mm -hmm. so not according to the Levitical uh, right. lineage. So talk story about that a little bit. What what, well, what do we mean uh, by who, who carries that on? Is it is it is it all Christians? Is it is it is it uh, just just the priests who are offering mass? Or who, when we say that those words in the mass, and we're referring to Melchizedek? Well, Mac Melchizedek is the first man in the Bible to be referred to as a priest. You know, mm. he's the first one to whom the word Cohen is 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 applied. Um, but really. When we go back further in, in the book of Genesis, when we go back to the beginning of the book of Genesis, we see that Adam himself, the first man, was portrayed as a priest. He's placed in, um, in, in the garden uh, with the purpose of, um, of, of tilling it and keeping it, you know, and the, the Hebrew verbs for, for t tilling it and keeping it are, are the same verbs that are used to describe the action of priests in the sanctuary of the tabernacle oh, wow. or the temple, so Adam is being portrayed as a priest, and uh, and and the rabbis like to point this out too, that uh, that so many of the details of the description of the garden match the details of the sanctuary and the temple, right? No kidding. And even at the end, when he's expelled, there are those two angels mm -hmm. who are placed at the at the um, at the the gate, so that he can't ever ever profane the uh, the sanctuary again. Well, there were those two images in the temple too, guarding the sanctuary. So there's this correspondence between sacrificial worship as it happened in the tabernacle and then the temple and the story of Adam in Genesis. So Adam really is portrayed as the first priest. And, and Jesus and is, I'm sorry, and Jesus is our high priest. Yes, and, and, and yes. We can, but, we, but the priesthood didn't end when the, when the temple fell. Because no, I, no, no. Uh, we got to come. Mean, we got. We got to come back. Like, we're already <laughs> done. But uh, that's why I'm just gonna. Well, I'm gonna segue to this. But yeah. So the. So the. the when the, when the temple uh, fell and, and and temple worship stopped, the the royal priesthood continued. 
and the priesthood, the, the priestly office and the mass, continue, the sacrifice of the mass, which is, we'll talk about what a sacrifice is when we come back, why we call this the sacrifice of the mass. We'll be right back with Mike Aquilina. I'm supposed to tell everybody about every four minutes who's my guest, and, and I, never, I never can because we just start rolling. We'll be right back with Mike Aquilina, and we can talk more about the early church fathers and how they uh, read the Bible. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. This is Bear Wozniak coming to you from my home in Waikiki Beach with a deep adventure moment. You know, people ask me, what does it take to paddle out in big surf? You know, 20 foot plus surf is deadly surf. What does it take to paddle out in big waves? My son Jeremiah paddled, surfed 80 foot waves. What does it take to prepare to do that? And I give them my 20, 20, 20 rule. The first thing is you should be able to paddle your surfboard for 20 miles. If you can't do that, don't paddle out in heavy surf because big surf can get bigger and you can find yourself locked outside uh, for forever for a long long time second thing is you should be able to hold your breath for the time that it takes the sun to set it's an ancient hawaiian tradition to pray the moment the sun hits the ocean until it sinks beneath it and that's about two minutes and 20 seconds if you can't do that don't paddle out in big surf the other thing is we dive down, grab a rock 20 feet deep, and then run underwater. If you can't do that, don't paddle out in big surf. But the thing is, in life, you're already out in big surf. Whether you like it or not, you are. What are you going to do to prepare? The 20, 20, 20 rule. Spend 20 minutes in prayer three times a day, or maybe spend 40 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes at night. But if you're a man and you're not praying an hour every day, you're in trouble. The people you love are in trouble. You should be getting up early and slaying dragons. Your children should see you pray. If you're not praying 20, 20, 20 a day, then we what we say in Hawaii when we see a guy on the beach that's wearing surf clothing, but he never goes out in big surf, we call them posers. If you're not spending an hour every day with the Lord, you're losing out. And the other thing, it's so much easier to pray for an hour a day than to pray for pray for five minutes because when you spend 30 minutes with the Lord you want to spend 40 when you spend 40 you want to spend an hour so follow the 20 20 20 rule in life spend an hour every day in prayer this is Bear Wozniak with a deep adventure.com you can gain traction in the virtues in my book deep adventure the way of heroic virtue and you can be inspired by my personal testimony of heartache and triumph with my book, A Surfing Guide to the Soul, both newly published by Sophia and available at our web store, deepadventure.com and also on amazon.com. Hey, if you haven't been to the Bear Wozniak, deepadventure.com web store, you really will be shocked what we have there. We have all of my books, and since I'm a Benedictine Oblate, we have the St. Benedict exorcism necklaces and rings and crosses too. Plus tons of cool t-shirts for men and women, wrist rosaries, warrior rosaries, daily inspirational journals for either a man or a woman, and so much more. Our deepadventure.com web store is awesome. So check it out if you want to find the perfect gift. Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Hey, everybody. Uh, our TV show, Long Ride Home, is still airing on EWTN, and uh, we all seasons are up on Prime Video now, so you can go there to view it. And we're editing the fourth season, probably fourth, fifth, and sixth season, which all take place in Hawaii. The the, the pack rides through Hawaii, and, and we do one, one thing that we're working on right now is this ride that we do in a, called the uh, Tantalus Ride, where you, we go up the side of the volcano, the uh, not the not the one on the big island, the, the one here in Oahu that's dormant. But um, the guys who have ridden some really, and we've ridden some pretty radical roads. We've ridden the Tail of the Dragon, for example, over there in North Carolina, which is considered the, it is actually the deadliest road in, in, in America. There's about a death every three weeks there. It's pretty gnarly. Uh, but... Um, but we rode the Tantalus, and all the riders said it was even more challenging than the Tale of the Dragon. So uh, you got you got to tune in, watch our show on Prime Video, 
Uh, you can also, though, by joining Bears Man Cave or the School of Manliness, you get uh, instant access to all the episodes. So you get all the episodes, uh, uh, access to, to, uh, to all the episodes immediately. And every time we do a rough edit we're, before the EWTN says take this out or add this or do this to it, uh, you get that rough edit before it even is seen by EWTN or aired by EWTN. So uh, go to deepadventure.com and uh, join the Man Cave or the, or the, um, or the Mama Bears. Uh, we're back here with Mike Aquilina, who is a... Who is a, a, a who just lives uh, inside these walls of books? In fact, have you ever have has anybody ever tried to come into your office and try to find you and they just can't find you and you're just hidden behind? A, you know, I just imagine one day they come in and just one of these has fallen and you're buried under the, this mountain <laughs> of books. <laughs> no, it's happened. If I go way back in that direction, yeah. I can uh, I can I can go looking for books and that sort of thing. And so when my kids come into the office, they don't see me. And yeah. and if I drop a book or something, you'll just see them jump about a foot. <laughs> wow, what a beautiful beautiful. Uh, we were talking <laughs> earlier before we started how I started my. Uh, People, someone had asked me once, "Why well, I really like the background that you have." They thought that what I had in the back of my back of me here, which is all stuff on the early church fathers, is just a backdrop. And you said it's happened to you too, but, <laughs> but I'm yes. just trying to get mine to look like yours. Hey, we're, so we're talking about uh, the priesthood and Melchizedek, uh, and, and of course, uh, uh, you know, Cain and Abel offered sacrifice. We know that. That's right. Why, why, uh, so, so, so when the, I think it's a, such an incredibly important point that at that time when the temple walls fell the sacrifice had already begun to be tr celebrated by the early church uh on a daily basis and in in uh um in, in they would meet at households and they would have the the reading of the word and the and the breaking of the bread they had which is exactly what we do in mass first half is the liturgy of the word where we share scripture and the second half is the mass so right. often in so many churches today you basically just have the reading of the word you don't have the sacrifice of the mass they may have communion every now and then uh, but we still wouldn't consider that the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ because it's not done by an ordained uh, priest. But so talk about this, the Melchizedek, and, 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 and what it is to offer a sacrifice. Why do we call it the sacrifice of the Mass? Well, you know, we see from the story of Adam that it's something that's just built into our nature. You know, we have this, this instinct for offering sacrifice, for giving back to the Lord the good things that he has given given to us, you know, returning them to him in a sense with gratitude. And that's what we call the Mass the Eucharist. Eucharist just means thanksgiving, you know. So we want to make a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to honor our Lord, giving, giving the gifts back to him, so to speak. Um, you can see this kids just naturally want to do this with their parents, right? Their parents give them things and, and, uh, and they want to give something to their parents. So they'll ask their parents for paper. All right. So you give them paper and give me crayons. And, you know, you give them crayons and they make some scribbles on a piece of paper. Uh, or, or they, they eat it or the they eat the crayons. They might eat the crayons. <laughs> My kids did. But yeah, so yeah. go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, I mean, they're, they're offering back these gifts to their parents and, and with, with their own mark on them. Uh, you know, that's what Adam was to do with the whole earth, right? And oh, we beautiful. see that his children, Cain, his sons, Cain and Abel, were, were also attempting to do this, right? Because it's their, their conflict comes about because of, because of the differences in their attitude toward mm. sacrifice. So that first drama after the fall, the, 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 the first drama is a, is a drama about sacrifice. And then Abraham, we see offering sacrifice, and he gets to know this priest, Melchizedek. We see um, the, uh, the, the patriarchs in the, the time of, uh, of, of uh, after Abraham, the generations after Abraham, the patriarchs all functioned as, as priests. They stood as mediators between God and man, and they offered sacrifice. That's what priests do. And then at the time of Moses, uh, because of the sin of Israel. Israel was intended to be a nation of priests, but uh, because of their sin in worshiping the golden calf, the, the, the priesthood was restricted to just one tribe, the tribe of, of Levi. Um, so the Levites were the ones who performed the priestly duties in the, um, in the time of the tabernacle, the wandering sanctuary, and then the, the time of the temple when it was established in, in Jerusalem. Uh, when when David takes the throne, we find that he is harking back to the time of Melchizedek, the priest king, and David functions as a priest king, 
who has sacrificial duties as well as the duties of authority of ruling the people and his son solomon fulfills the same office and yet it all falls apart for them too because of their sins mm -hmm. they foreshadowed a fulfillment that was still to come mm -hmm. in a thousand years uh they foreshadowed the coming of the messiah uh, jesus christ who would be the son of david and jesus did come as the perfect priest he is the new adam he is the son of david you know and of mm -hmm. course the 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 letter to the hebrews invokes uh melchizedek um as as the the great uh, the great progenitor of jesus christ so he is the fulfillment we participate in his priesthood through our baptism mm -hmm. so every day everything i do at this laptop everything i do at this desk i'm the priest and this is mm -hmm. my altar i'm mm -hmm. offering a sacrifice of my work because i made my morning offering that day and i and i told the lord at the beginning of my day that whatever i do at this desk i'm offering in union with the holy sacrifice of the mass offered throughout the world mm, that's be that's powerful um we could talk a lot more about what the nature of a sacrifice is but it, it's basically like you said it's it, to be g given in gratitude i think some i think in the, so many of the pagan religions are, are, are the sacrifice is given to appease mm. but we give to please it's yeah. a totally you know the, the hebrew scriptures are so fascinating because when you read the beauty especially of things like the psalms i mean the 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 concept of there being one god and the and and the way that, that this god is a god of justice and the god of love mm -hmm. is so uh incredibly unique compared to all the other pagan religions that are out there and your new book how to how the fathers read the bible the early church fathers read the bible uh that they were they were reading the Old Testament, mm -hmm. you know, yes. they might have been reading some of the letters, you know, the Gospels, and as time went on, and the letters of Paul, and the, and and the, those sorts of things. But t t we're gonna have one t a chance to uh, have you introduce the next segment. Uh, what do, what what's the essence of that? What, what when you say that? How did they read the Bible? Well, really, they heard the Bible, right? Yeah. Because most of the Christians during that time, most of the people in the world could not read. Right. They and books were too expensive. Only the very, very, very wealthy could afford to own books. So most people could not read what they did was they went to mass and it was at mass that they heard the scriptures read aloud, proclaimed and then heard the scriptures interpreted in the homilies. So so really, my book is about how those first Christians encountered Jesus Christ through the scriptures in the context of the Holy Mass because the the Eucharist was the natural and supernatural habitat for the Holy Scriptures how beautiful you know when I when I when I write a book or when I'm writing something uh, do you ever, do you do this when I write when I'm done with a chapter I, I will read it out loud and it's amazing how many changes I make because of the the flow of that because you want to have a sort of poetic flow or things need yeah. to flow well and, and 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 I this is something that Mike I actually made up but probably Augustine said it first, but I, it was unheard of to sit and read silently back in those mm -hmm. days, right? Yeah. They, if you had, if you're fortunate to have, you were reading, you read out loud. You mostly, most of the scholars read out loud instead of just sat and read. So don't you think that's a Augustine, good pun? Augustine did read, write about that. Because no! He, he said <laughs> the, first, <laughs> the first man he saw reading silently was St. Ambrose. Uh, and it, it made an impression on him that Ambrose was walking and looking down and reading as he walked. But he wasn't um, reading out loud. No. Mm -mm. You know what? Augustine, that, that, Augustine plagiarizes me all the time. I just <laughs> get so old. We're talking you with could do worse. <laughs> what a plagiarist. Gee, I can't believe he did that to me again. Uh, we're talking with Mike Aquilina. He's uh, our most re our our guest that comes and joins us more often. Than anyone else, and that's because we just love to have this. We love them, and we love to have a conversation about the early church fathers. When we get back, we're going to talk more about how the early church fathers read the Bible. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Oh, Mike, I keep forgetting to ask, where can they find you? Oh, well, they can find me at fathersofthechurch.com. Fathersofthechurch.com. Yeah, I tried to get that uh, that uh, website, but not possible. <laughs> that, that you probably got that and uh, Coca, then coca-cola.com at the same time is that how far back it goes <laughs> there, he got that uh, back in 100 AD probably is when you first reserved that name the early church during fathers during the Bar Kokhba <laughs> revolt <laughs> yeah. okay we'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure 
Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to NotreDameFCU.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. We invite our mama bears to join our non-Facebook community created just for you to share the journey with each other and to take the self-guided one-year course on the Virtues Plus. You have free access to all of the Long Ride Home TV show, all of the Bear Wozniak video version of our radio show, plus the Catechism in a Year videos, all at deepadventure.com. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak Adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Our guest, Mike Aquilina. We're talking about how the early church fathers read the Bible. Just jump in there, Mike. Mike, of course, our expert on the early church fathers. Everyone knows we're Mike Aquilina. Well, it's not only the church fathers who read the Bible this way, who encountered it in, in the, the context of the assembly. This is the way the Bible was written to be encountered. Okay? Right. And we yeah. find evidence of that all through the Bible, right? Yeah. Because Moses is in the desert and he receives the law and he needs to seal the covenant. So what does he do? He reads the law aloud to the assembly of the people and then he sprinkles them with blood sacrificial blood mm. and he says behold the blood of the covenant so this is this is a moment that's kind of a, a paradigm and we find our lord himself invoking that moment when, when at his last supper right because he takes the chalice he takes the chalice and he he says essentially behold the blood of the covenant he said he says that this chalice is the new covenant in my blood right mm. so um so he establishes the uh, the mass as doing what what the the old sacrifices had done. Wow! When we read Saint Paul's letters, when we read the Book of Revelation, we find in those books that there are instructions for reading these texts aloud in the liturgy. Okay, there are instructions for the lectors. Paul was careful to do that because he knew that that's the way his words would be encountered by most Christians. As I said before, at that time, most Christians could not read. They could not read, and even if they could read, they could not afford to buy books. Now today, I've got all the books of the Bible on my smartphone, right? Mm. And I've got all kinds of Bible study aids on my smartphone, and I even own Bibles that I can fit in my pocket. So I could take the Bible with me everywhere, but only the wealthiest people had access to paper copies of the Bible back then. The wealthiest people. And even then, they might only own like one or two books of the Bible, not not the whole thing. So, so again, what I try to emphasize in my book is that the Mass is the ordinary way that people who practice biblical religion encounter the Word of God. It's the ordinary way. It's proclaimed during the readings, and it's uh, interpreted in the homily. How beautiful. I mean, just, just, just beautiful uh, to consider that, you know, the other thing is, you know, speaking of the rarity of, of the written word, I know the monks of the desert often they would have a copy of the Book of Psalms, or if they if they did that, maybe they'd you know copied it themselves. It was just rare, and one of the bad raps the Catholic Church has is that it, uh, well, the Catholics they used to chain the Bible to the altar, you know, or things like that. Well, that's because it was the most valuable thing in the probably in that diocese, that area. In that town, right? <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, you didn't want anybody to just come and take it. You know, it wasn't like uh, we didn't want anybody to read it. Yeah. That, that's the, were, that's the, what's implied, right? If you're a thief and you're going through town at night and you wanted to steal something of value, you'd, you'd go for one of the books. 
because books could not be reproduced except by hand, laboriously, and it yeah. required skilled labor that was very expensive. And one of the, and one of the beautiful things the church did uh, is the, the monks. Uh, they copied manuscripts of of scripture, as well as, of course, our great uh, philosophers and other uh, other great works. You know, of, of mm -hmm. the of the of the Greek uh, the Greek writers. And and if it weren't for that that tradition of copying and meticulously copying. So how did they interpret? That's how they read. How did they interpret the scriptures? Well, that ordinarily happened during the sermons, during the homilies that were that were preached during mass. And that's where most interpretation happens today. That's where most life application happens today. We're, we're sitting there and we hear the homily that opens up the readings that we've just heard. Um, so, uh, so, so that's the way it happened then. There, there were some of the fathers who went through verse by verse and did a commentary on the scriptures and we possess a lot of those you have those same books behind you that i have behind me and these books the um uh, the the ancient christian commentary on scripture uh, they collect these interpretations of the early church fathers uh, into a running commentary of the entire bible both the old testament well, and the new well he, he, okay so here's the thing i mean er, early on i'm sure Augustine plagiarized me on this too, but when I was a young man, I, I read the scriptures, uh, Paul writing, talking about spirit, soul, and body. You know, we have a spiritual soul, different than the animals. We have a spiritual soul. But he talked about spirit, soul, and body. And when I read scripture, I loved the Old Testament uh, because I saw in the Bible three levels of, of understanding it. I thought of the body as, well, here's the story. This is actually what happened. And then the soul of it was like, this is a practical application for you. And then there was this deeper level, the spiritual level, that said, here is a, a almost allegorical, spiritual way of looking at it. And the early church fathers had a way of looking at it at three levels, too. How did they, I mean, I know Augustine stole this from me, but, but um, what, well, how, how was it, well, how did they, there is that, they, they did look at it often as having three levels. They did, they did, and that's something that you'll find often in the church fathers. Sometimes they'll even speak of four levels. Uh, oh well, so, give me so the three, and then give me the fourth. <laughs> give me the different church fathers had different schemes for understanding how the how the the scriptures could be could be interpreted. Um, but uh, but those those who said there were four, you know, compared them to the the four wheels of a chariot. You know? ah. so so this is um, this is this is the way that they they would approach scripture. Uh, people will sometimes understand that wrongly as if the church fathers were somehow uh, denying the historical truth you know uh, and and putting it aside uh, so that they could emphasize these allegorical truths or or whatever uh, tropological or moral truths. okay what's tro or, what st st tro tropological <laughs> Oh, bear! You're going to take me into into regions that I'm 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 inexpert with. Um, uh, Wait a minute. Let me let me write this down. This is a <laughs> what date and time is this? this? Is the first time I've stumped Mike Aquilina. I'm going to record this time and date. But but the, the, the going just going into that though. The, the, when they, we talked about the allegorical uh, way or the or maybe more the spiritual. It doesn't have to be allegorical, but the spiritual sense of scripture. Uh, some of the early church fathers just just um, beautiful interpretations of the Bible in that in that sense. Yes, yes, yes. They 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 did, and uh, and this was a specialty of the Alexandrian school. Uh, they they would go in and uh, and and give you the scriptures at many levels. They uh, they um, they they would uh, uh, they they would they would uh, they would they would talk about how the scriptures. Um, told us of heaven and told us of the nature of God uh, so that every single line of the scripture was shown to have depths that you would mm. not perceive mm. if you were not watching you know if you're not we're not looking for it if you didn't have the grace to receive it uh, when, and, and now uh, the four wheels of the chariot or the four wheels uh, what, what were those for you're going to keep pressing me on. Well, this, you know, so we, I'm going to have to look it no, up. I know that. Well, I'm a CPA. People ask me questions. I go, I don't know, but I'm a great researcher. I mean, I know enough to know that I need to look it up at least, you know. But no, that's good. We, uh, Saint John Chrysostom. What was yes. his? What was? What was his nickname? What did? What did his name mean? His name was Golden Mouth. The Golden uh, Mouth. You know, Chrysos Chrysostom means golden. Chrysostom. Mouth. Okay. And he gained that for his uh, his eloquence in preaching. 
he had been trained in rhetoric by the greatest rhetorician in the empire, uh, um, Libanius, who was a pagan, who had also trained, you know, the emperors of his time. So Chrysostom really did receive the best education possible for preaching, you know. Uh -huh. uh, he uh, and and he had the best formation possible too, because as a young man he went to live as a hermit on Mount Silpius in in Antioch, and while he was up there on the mountain. He would spend his nights in committing the scriptures to memory. Okay, he would. He didn't want to sleep. He just wanted to read the scriptures. So he would stand up with his arms outstretched so that he wouldn't fall asleep, and he would read the scriptures aloud until he com had committed them to memory. And we could see his command of the scriptures in mm -hmm. his preaching. Yeah, he really did have so much of it. Just that easy access in his mind. Yeah, and be, and so, uh, so, but so many, so many of the uh, what what are uh, examples of some of the books that you've written uh, that talk about uh, the Old Testament and uh, its application, for example, in the Mass and and things like that. How you can see that the the Old Testament flowing into the New Testament. Yes, uh, well, one book I wrote is called the Eucharist Foretold, the, the Lost Prophecy of Malachi, and it just looks at Malachi one eleven. That, that passage that you and I talked about earlier. So that's one that, that, that goes into this in great depth. And of course, my most recent book is How the Fathers Read the Bible, Scripture, Liturgy, and the Early Church. And this really does go through the fathers one by one. And it, it talks about how the fathers considered the Bible in the context of the huh. Mass. I, yeah. I'd say that almost all of my books. How, how many books have you, have you written or, or co-authored? Uh, more than 70. So more than... All of these books, <laughs> all the Nicene fathers, the anti-Nicene, and, and my commentaries. Uh, no, I don't. Well, uh, some of, my books are pretty thin <laughs> compared to those. Okay, so seventy of mine would probably fit on, you know, just a couple. Well, of how many were here. in the Septuagint? How many books? Yeah, well, the books of the Old Testament. Oh, how many? So, no, how, oh, no, wait. How many? How oh. many men uh, wrote wrote the Septuagint? 72 72 yes. so you got if you yeah. get two more books I'll, I'll call you a <laughs> I'll call you an Alexandrian scholar <laughs> we're talking with Mike Aquilina our, our most I guess he's been here more often than anybody and what, what is your where can they find you Mike well they can find me at fathersofthechurch.com um, my books go to catholicbooksdirect.com catholicbooksdirect.com that's where you'll get the best price on my books and they have a page just dedicated to my books Oh, it's beautiful. We love you, Mike Aquilina. Um, well, this is being uh, this is being aired on during Holy Week, and we are, and this is Holy Week. So for everyone there, uh, Happy Easter! And Mike, thank you for joining us. Until next time, may the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you. You ready to plug your ears, Mike? <laughs> aloha. Hey, if you haven't been to the BearWoznik DeepAdventure dot com web store, you really will be shocked what we have there. We have all of my books. And since I'm a Benedictine oblate, we have the St. Benedict exorcism necklaces and rings and crosses too. Plus tons of cool t-shirts for men and women, wrist rosaries, warrior rosaries, daily inspirational journals for either a man or a woman, and so much more. Our deepadventure.com web store is awesome. So check it out if you want to find the perfect gift.